that's not what I have. So it's just plain. I know I think you follow up with me. My ex husband and I are the Mississippi uh, Riverboat. Yes. Okay, I think we're going to go back to Isaac. Let's see. He was putting money in, and I was close. We wanted quite a bit of money back. Here's his dad. He was quite a bit of money. Because I didn't know this. I didn't know this. Thank you for coming and welcome. Been here before, and this is your first Heritage Night. Thank you so much for joining. If you're a regular, then welcome back. Um, so, I wanted to introduce these two gentlemen who uh, wanted to speak for us tonight. This is Craig Staley. And then Mark. And I'm Mark Hedlund. <laughs> So we're here tonight to talk to you about the Battle of Ludlow, which took place April 20th, 1914. It's a case of class warfare that has essentially gone on since the founding of our country, where you have the wealthy mine owners or company owners essentially battling their own personnel in this case. Um, like I said, it's a uh, the Colorado National Guard gets involved. Um, it, it, it's a really a watershed moment for uh, the labor movement in this country and as we go on we'll talk about like one of the better outcomes was the establishment of the eight hour day is what essentially came from this battle so start off this is the memorial currently at Ludlow and it talks about in the memory of men women and children who lost their lives in freedom's cause at Ludlow Colorado 20, April 20th 1914. And it was erected by the United Mine Workers of America on May 30th, 1918. And uh, moving on, here's a topographical map of the area. Um, unfortunately, I lost my laser pointer. So, but if you can see up here, we have the level 10 colony by Aguilar. And you've got Rouse Prior. And then you have all your other little mining camps that were. In, in the Arroyos and Canyonlands of Los Angeles, <coughs> Hastings, Tabasco, Berlin, Tolliver, and Justin, and Forbes. Um, you got Trinidad to the south, so pretty soon you're in the coast of line, essentially. Um, talking about, uh, if you look at how Ludlow is, it's kind of situated as half by itself. So, in my readings and study on the subject, I kind of think that when the Colorado National Guard and the uh, Warfield County, Los Angeles County Law Enforcement, and Baldwin Feltz uh, Detective Agency decided to take action. They went to Ludlow not only because it's the biggest camp uh, with about 1,200 miners in the families, but it's also essentially separated and it's out in the open country, so there's a target of opportunity if you like. So one thing about this area that, and in my studies of, of what happened with Ludlow that made this area so much a focus happened eons, millions of years before. This area through here, we're kind of where we're at right now, millions of years ago, even before Sam was young, um, <laughs> was primordial forest and, and, and water. A lot of it was underwater. And through, and I'm not a geologist, but through tectonic plates and shifts and whatever. Coal was born in this area. And one thing about this area in Colorado is that the coal that they found, you know, Colorado's always been kind of a mining state. It's kind of one of our big claims is all of our, we've got our, our state's riches by mining. But in this area, the coal was of such high quality. And this is at the time of steel, and the steel mill, the steel mill here in Pueblo, the industrial revolution, and they needed a higher quality coal to run the smelters, to run the fires in the coal plants. And all the coal that they found underneath this area was prime. It is what they needed to run those furnaces. Um, other coals, and they know the chemical composition of coals, but it just wasn't the same quality as they found underneath here. And it was also a little, I'm not saying, no coal is easily accessible, but this coal was by, by all means, because of where it was at, because of the rail lines, and because of, of the workforce um, was just ripe for the picking. 
So then the coal barons came in and started the mines. You can see all these are obviously like one mine, Coatdale. We go to Coatford. All of these are just mines, 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 mines. Some of them still in operation up through the 20s and 30s, even after So, cool. Moving along, we're going to talk about the major personalities that set. Battle of Ludlow into motion. And like I talked about earlier, it's a class warfare. It's rich versus poor, essentially. The Rockefellers versus their immigrant uh, employees, essentially. Um, so and this has been going on for decades and decades. And all these guys really wanted was a fair wage, decent working hours, and safe mining conditions. They weren't really asking for much, but when it come down to it, it was really all about the, the bottom dollar. And, uh, Moving on. And, and it, part of this is part of what you can in school, you study the American dream. The immigrants coming from overseas, a lot of the, the, the miners in this area weren't American. They were Welsh, Irish, German, um, Greek, Italian. Um, and the Ludlow Camp, you read uh, an account of Ludlow Camp that there was, it's only said it sounded like the Tower of Babel. A thousand tongues being spoken. And, and, and all these folks were coming from here. And if you can imagine, it's not like today where if you get tired of a job, you can just get up and go and, and print your resume and go find another job in a few days. These people had traveled thousands of miles to come out here to Colorado to work. And what they wanted was part of that American dream, part of that coming out of the, going to New York Harbor, and what's the first thing you see? Statue of Liberty. So, you know, give us your tired, your poor, a little yearning. And here they come yearning to come to Southern Colorado to work, to establish that dream, and to make better for their families. So here's the big cheese, John D. Rockefeller Sr. He's a principal owner, obviously, of Standard Oil, as you all know, and CF&I, Colorado Fuel and Iron. Mm -hmm. And uh, he does own a majority of the mines in Southeast Colorado at this time. So he's got the means of production. He's got, he's got it all, essentially. And he does gift CF&I one birthday to his son, Junior, John D. Rockefeller Jr. And then his, I don't know if I'd call it not ignorance, but his basically him not wanting to get involved or not understanding what's going on helps lead to the events of April 20th. And then we have uh, John Lawson, Mark, if you'd like to speak. I know, uh, just uh, I'm speaking of uh, you know, Rockefeller, uh, the, the senior and junior, um, that first slide that Craig had up of, of the monument was it was dedicated in 1918, and the little this kind of footnote will kind of talk about at the end. When that monument was being dedicated, Rockefeller Jr. was there. He wanted to, he felt like he needed to make some type of amends, maybe deal with some ghosts of Ludlow. So he arrived and he was there with his chauffeur and he wanted to speak to the crowds. And they told him. Not the right time. We're a little worried about your safety. So he watched that monument dedicated from his limousine a distance away. And this is John Lawson. He's officially the, the ramrod of the movement in yeah. Southern Colorado Coast. Yeah. He was, he was, uh, any, any movement has a leader. And uh, John R. Lawson was, was the leader. He was, uh, I guess, if you can have like Rockefeller being on one side, this was, this was Lawson was Rockefeller and the mine's antagonist. He, he was a very educated man, um, had worked in mines before. Um, I don't know if you can see his hands, but those aren't, those aren't soft hands. Those are working man's hands. And, and he knew the labors that these, what these, what these miners, were, what, what they were up against. And so he helped organize some of the strikes here in, in Southern Colorado. And then we have Lamont Bowers. He's the go-to guy for the Rockefellers here. Colorado is involved with CF9, he's involved with the mines. And I think there's some miscommunication between the Rockefellers and him, and that helped contribute to those events. Moving along, we have Governor Elias Ammons, who was elected in 1912 as a Democrat, and uh, the Rockefellers and others refer to him as the cowboy governor. And I don't think it's because of his how he ran things, but because maybe he's a little slow. So, they refer to him as the cowboy woman. Um, and then he officially doesn't do anything to reprimand 
uh, any of his officers from the Colorado National Guard, and that helps obviously contribute to what's going on. Uh, Mother Jones, Mary Harris, also known as Mother Jones, uh, she was a very popular champion of the working man. Um, some uh, people saw her as an agitator, and in some ways she was. She brought attention to the plights of the miners. Um, this isn't the last time that you're going to hear anything of, of Mother Jones. Um, she, uh, was, and, and she was elderly at the time of Ludlow, um, and she was arrested by uh, the militia and she was interned at, interned at the old San Rafael Hospital in Trinidad, uh, which they had converted into kind of a makeshift prison. Um, they thought that they were going to get, maybe do her in. Uh, she had no heat in her room. They got to remember the time of Ludlow when she was there, was, it was still winter. Um, and it was a particularly cold winter that year. So they thought they were going to teach her, uh, teach her a, a, a good lesson by putting her in, a, in a, an unheated room. But uh, she's a tough, tough woman, very tough woman. Uh, not only did she survive this, but like I said, she brought a lot of attention uh, to the plight of the coal mine and the coal workers, and then also played a, played a role in some of the coal mine strikes uh, that happened in the early 20s, too. So, it, it, yeah, it's not the last time we're going to hear about Mother Jones. Uh, Louis, uh, they were called Louis, Louis the Greek, is a nickname they had for him. Um, he was a, 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 a uh, leader of the Ludlow camp, um, kind of a tragic figure um, that was born in, in Greece, uh, immigrated to the United States, uh, came out here to the coal fields to work. Um, educated, um, uh, well, well versed, uh, spoke Greek, English, uh, was a good negotiator, um, and he was always in negotiations with the powers that be to try to find a non violent end to all of this. Um, he was not he was not an agitator. He was not at the front lines with a rifle. He was always working with the National Guard, working with the leaders, to try to find some way to, to, to let the strikers strike and let the government do, do their job. Um, one thing about Louis, Louis, uh, Louis the Greek um, at Ludlow, and, and we'll talk about him a little more too, is that he lost his life at Ludlow. And, and rather tragically, um, during the, the, the attack on the camp, he stayed in the camp the entire day. The Ludlow Battle Massacre um, started at 9 o'clock in the morning and ran the entire length of the day. It wasn't just a quick incident. It was a 12, 10 to 12 hour long gunfight between the miners and between the militia and, and, and law enforcement. And he stayed in the camp the entire day trying to take women and children out of the camp. He didn't run. He stayed right there, tried to negotiate with, with the National Guardsmen. Um, in the evening, after everything had kind of died down and the camp had been lit on fire, uh, he and two of his lieutenants were uh, caught by uh, the National Guardsmen. Now, and, and let me preface something. When I say National Guardsmen, um, a lot of the National Guardsmen weren't, and Craig can expand on this, weren't National Guardsmen. A lot of them were militiamen that had just been put in uniforms that were either strike breakers, some of them are agitators, some of them are just guys that were looking for a paycheck. Who came in and got a uniform and were asked to, to do this task. Uh, some of them um, were really uh, taken aghast by what happened, and some of them relished the violence. Um, but but Lewis was, was, and two of his lieutenants were caught at the, in the, towards the end of the battle um, by uh, Lieutenant Linderfeld. Um, and it's always kind of tough talking about how he, how he ended his life. But he was trying to negotiate with the lieutenant, and the lieutenant took a rifle from one of the soldiers that was with him, a Springfield rifle just like this one. Um, and smashed Louis de Greek over the head with the rifle. So hard it actually snapped the rifle stock. Louis de Greek fell to the ground, dead. Um, and then just a few seconds later, the other National Guardsmen that were with the lieutenant uh, shot them all, um, right by the train tracks by the Ludlow camp. Uh, Louis and his two lieutenants' bodies laid out there by the train tracks for three days. Uh, the Guardsmen would not let uh, strikers or would not let anyone collect their bodies until the railroad complained so much about 
their bodies laying in the side of the road in puddles of blood that they finally relented and took them to Trinidad. Uh, he's buried in Trinidad, um, visited his grave, um, and it's kind of a sobering thought to think that you know he spent the day saving women and children and uh, ended his life um, with his head smashed in and shot in the back. So this is Adjutant General John Chase. He's an ophthalmologist in Denver. He's the Brigadier General, essentially. Uh, he's the top officer for the Colorado National Guard. He's been involved for quite a while. He's dealt with striking mines before in Cripple Creek, 1903, 1904. Um, here he'll overstep his authority as Governor Adams just lets him essentially run amok. And uh, implement martial law in the strike zone, which he had no power to do. And again, he refuses to step in, and he lets his subordinates run wild, and that helps lead to what goes on. And then it also, after Ludlow with the battles of Ludlow and Walsenburg, if he would have taken charge like he should have, those battles never would have happened. And then we have Major Pat Hamrock. He owns a saloon in Trinidad. He's really popular with everybody the miners live in. He, like Mr. Tikas, he does try to uh, help with uh, keeping the situation calm, but he finds himself kind of torn between trying to keep the peace and uh, doing his duties as a major in the Colorado National Guard. Um, and he sets off one of the points as he'll call down to the Trinidad National Guard Armory and tell him, put that baby in a buggy and bring it up. And he's talking about the machine gun that was at the Trinidad uh, Armory as he felt like events were about to spiral out of control. And then we have Lieutenant Carl Linderfeld. This guy is kind of interesting. Um, and it's kind of ironic, he started off his career as a cold, as a hard rock miner. So you think he would have some compassion towards the plight of famous immigrant miners, but obviously he does not. He's kind of a hothead. I think he's really a psychopath, to be honest with you. Um, he did start with the Colorado National Guard in the cavalry, and then he did go to China and fight in Boxer Belly in 1900. And then prior to Ludlow, uh, he Bates, uh, General Chase to send him to Trinidad to essentially be his eyes and ears and see what's going on with, with the strike. And then he will, uh, as the actual National Guard draw down due to lack of funding, he'll go out personally and start to recruit strike breakers and uh, deputies from Los Animas and Workman counties, mine guards to fill in for his company B as the other National Guard hadn't been paid in six months, so there was a provision that said they, they could return home if the state hadn't paid them. So that helps with, uh, and then like we said, he did, he was present when uh, obviously he murdered Louis Tikas and assaulted him. He'll be charged later on with assault, but essentially get a slap on the wrist at a court martial. And then here we have uh, Sheriff Jefferson B. Farr. He's, Orfano County is his own little playground. He's the king, and everybody's his peasant. Um, he's good friends with everybody, all the uh, administrators at CFNI. And um, so he works with the, the National Guard and helping get those guys uh, in uniform, essentially. And then last but not least, we have President Woodrow Wilson. So the 20th president of the United States. And uh, He's more concerned with what's going on in Veracruz, Mexico. There's a, a big international crisis with us and the Mexicans. And then, obviously, there's growing unrest in Europe. We're getting ready for World War One to kick off in August. So, and so he doesn't see the the strike and the events going on in the southern Colorado coal fields as worthy of his attention. And then, eventually, at the end, he'll send in two regiments of cavalry from Fort Riley, Kansas, to help restore order in the uh, strike zone. Oops, wrong way. So let's talk about the, uh, the, the factions, essentially. So the, the, the miners themselves, um, as the slide said, are a, are a multi-ethnic miner population. Um, they hail mainly from Southern and Eastern Europe, uh, Mexico, and Asia. Uh, and one of the battles um, that happened after the Ludlow fight at the Forbes mine uh, several Japanese miners were, were killed at that fight. Um, <clears throat> the way the miners uh, were, came and how they were paid um, at, at the mines 
um, and, and they, they worked for very low wage. Um, some of the miners worked six to seven, 12 hour days, and they weren't paid for something that was called dead work. And dead work in a mine is any work that does not involve bringing actual physical coal out of the mine. That included shoring up the mine shafts, sharpening tools, uh, cleaning up dirt, slag, debris. That was unpaid work. But these miners were expected to do that work. Now, the miners were also expected to shop at a company store. Most of these mining towns had a store that was owned by the mining company. They were paid in mining script, not US dollars, not gold coins. They were paid in a script that can only be cashed at that company store. So they couldn't shop at a competitor. And, the, and any medical care they needed was taken care of by the company doctor. And they were charged for that medical care. So the housing that they stayed in, the, some of the, the housing, if you read the period accounts, uh, the, the, the shacks that they lived in, some of these houses they had to share with two or three or four families. And, and the horrible conditions in some of these mining towns. And these, these miners, they worked and worked and worked. But Colorado already had mining laws in place. And just because these miners were from Italy and from Greece and from Wales did not mean that they knew about the law. But knowing about the law made them agitators. So they said, Colorado already has mining laws. Why aren't the mines enforcing these laws? And a lot of times what happened is by the time, the time then, when these miners were paid at the end of the month, they were actually in debt to the mining companies, month after month after month, deeper and deeper in debt. I always kind of remember that story about uh, St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. You couldn't leave until you paid off the company store. They did have schools for the mining children, but the mining schools were filled usually with mining propaganda. Kids were asked to work. Little kids were asked to work. You see pictures of little boys, small little boys, working in the mines because they could get into places where the adults couldn't. It was brutal, brutal work. And if you look at these men, and these men right here, are, are, this picture is taken after Ludlow when the miners uh, organized down in Trinidad, and they organized basically into a large military. And from, from April up through December, the entire southern part of Colorado was a war zone, where they fought this basically running battle with the National Guard law enforcement. Little did the National Guard law enforcement know that a lot of these men had military experience in Europe. In fact, Louis the Greek had served in the Greek army and had military experience. So these men weren't just a bunch of ragtag. They may look rough, but these, these are hardworking men and they're also lawyers. And I think that's why eventually when it got to the point where the government finally said, we need help, these guys are chasing us all over Southern Colorado and they're going to they're gonna wipe us out. Again, this isn't the last time this, happen, this happens. Um, after Ludlow goes through World War I, and then in 1920 rolls around, Blair Mountain, West Virginia. I don't know if any of you heard of Blair Mountain, the Battle of Blair Mountain, another Cold War that happened in West Virginia. Those were also a lot of immigrant coal miners, but they're also immigrant coal miners that were veterans of the United States Army in World War I. And they literally took on the state militia and had, it was, it was the longest and bloodiest labor strike in the United States. And a lot of the lessons that they learned at Blair Mountain they got from Blair Mountain. Now we're talking about the Colorado National Guard. They were instituted in 1879. And in that 35 year period from 1879 to 1914, they've been brought in to break up strikes, et cetera, about 16 times. Um, so the guardsmen would go out and arrest strikers under the guise of a military emergency, suspend civil authority, essentially establishing martial law. Um, so this, these guys were really, the, I wouldn't call them pawns, but they get it done for the, the wealthy white uh, mine owners, et cetera, uh, as they face off against poor you know, immigrant miners. So now we're talking about the Baldwin Fells Detective Agency. They were brought in by the Rockefellers to beef up mine security prior to Ludlow. These guys have a lot of experience in dealing with strikes and dealing with civil unrest. Um, 
So uh, later on, uh, prior to April 20th, some of these men will be recruited into companies A and B of Colorado National Guard. So they have, most of them have an ax to grind with uh, uh, the, mine, the striking miners. They uh, basically are, you know, there to, to finish the fight. Yeah, they, they were, they, these, these, to the strikers, the Baldwin Feltz detectives were, were the boogeymen. Uh, they were, they were the ones that the, the strikers were most afraid of because these, these men uh, were extremely aggressive. Um, prior to the actual, the, the April 20th uh, fight, um, how many of you have been to Ludlow? Have been to the Ludlow site? And, you, and, and just imagine in your mind the road that you took off of I-25 to get to the Ludlow site. That road was there in 1914. And Baldwin Feltz had a car modified, a sedan car, and I, and I can, I'm trying to find out whether it was a Ford or a Dodge or whatever, or what Dodge Brothers, but they took a car to the, the steel plant here in Pueblo and had it modified with steel plates all the way around the car. They took out the seats and inside the back of this car, they mounted a Colt machine gun. And that road that you take to drive up to the Ludlow site, on occasion, this car, which they called the Murder Special, nice name for a car, the Murder Special would drive up and down these roads and they would indiscriminately <laughs> at the camp. And then they would drive away. And the miners never, never, ever, they never knew when this car, but they would see a car coming down that dirt road and they would scatter because they would hear that car lumbering up and all of a sudden they tuck, 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 and they would just spray the camp with machine gun fire. That's how ruthless the Baldwin Feltz detectives were. Again, a few years later at, at Blair Mountain, Baldwin Feltz has a, a, another reappearance of strike breakers. Eventually, their tactics kind of fell out of, out of, out of, out of service, but these these were the boogeyman. So we're gonna now kind of go into the background of the Battle of Ludlow, essentially. And here we have the tent colony, as you can see. It's about 1,200 uh, family members, miners, et cetera. And you can tell it's a neat orderly camp. You have actual streets, um, sanitation, obviously. You got, you know, big laundry lines. So it's, it's not a disorganized camp. It's very established. It's, it's set on a parameter. And then we have the families. This, these are some of the faces that were there. Um, you know, and went through all this. So you can see in the camp itself, if you look at this, kind of don't want to blow it. You can see that all, all the tents, they're all cloth tents. And you can see a large tent right here. And on this one, you can still see in the back of the tent, and right above it's large United States flag. Over here is a Christian and Relief organization. They did, they had latrines. You can see way off on this picture, way off in the back, they had latrines, wash houses. They had uh, church meetings. They had schools. They, you, know, you can see there's children here at the camp. Um, this isn't a bunch of just rag ragamuffins. The camp was kept in well, and Louis the Greek was, was the leader of the camp, and he ran it very, very well. They had meetings every morning, the leaders of the camps and the different streets and different nationalities would come to the main tent, which you can see, which is that really big one there to the right. They would have meetings. They would discuss what they were going to do that day. They would get the kids to school, like I said, and, and it was it was very well run. It wasn't just um, a mob scene. 1,200 people in that camp. And you can see this, and you can still even see snow on the ground. This was almost right towards the time of the Ludlow, the Ludlow fight itself. Um, a few months a few months before, they had such a bad blizzard at, at that site that they had three-foot drifts that had covered the camp. And instead of abandoning the camp, Louis the Greek organized parties and they dug out all the streets, trying to get people to plow streets today. <laughs> Good luck with that. But they kept that camp well organized. One thing about the camp that, that you don't see in here, and these are miners. They're all miners and their families on strike. But this right here, right you're going to see probably right about here is that, that road that you travel on where that, the murder special would come and spray indiscriminately towards, towards the camp. Um, they dug cellars under these tents. And some of the cellars were just for extra room. These are miners. They're used to digging. They don't have to shore up earth and, and, and dig into and dig into the ground. But a lot of the, the lot of the cellars were for protection. 
because they were so scared at night that they would take their families and sleep down in these cellars. And they would take their, their, their mats and their mattresses and sleep underground just to protect themselves from the indiscriminate fire from the Baldwin Phelps car. So you can just imagine, you see these people, just, these aren't hard to tell, but they don't look like trouble. They just look like dads. This is, and this picture always kind of gets me because you can see these little girls wearing their nice Sunday, nice little Sunday dresses. And look at this, and I know it's kind of hard to tell, but people in photographs typically didn't smile. But this looks like a father and son. He's got a big grin on his face, proud sitting there with his boy. I'm proud for what he's doing right there at that moment, but shortly thereafter, everything was going to change. Well, here's a little bit of background. We're talking from roughly December 1912 to spring of 1914. So in December of 1912, the United Mine Workers of America will send 21 two-man teams into southern Colorado coal fields, and one was working as a miner, and the other would infiltrate company management, essentially, and the two would work in tandem to, to rat out any miners that might be opposed to unionization and report them to the company as union sympathizers. And at that time, that was a fireable offense. If you were a union man, you were gone. So as that happened, they would, uh, if that miner was fired, then these guys would go out and find somebody that was going to be uh, pro-union, and they would bring them in and to replace the, the other guy, essentially. And then some historians seem to think that it was about 3,000 pro-union miners were brought in to the coal fields like that under the nose, essentially, of Rockefeller and his associates. And then in the late summer of 1913, the United Mine Workers of America demanded CF and I implement new mine safety laws that had been enacted earlier that year, but the laws had no enforcement period. So CF and I says, you know, until they do that, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do it. There's no way you can have us do that because the state's not gonna enforce it. And then on the 16th, there's a, they demand a pay increase in recognition of the union, and then CNF is like, no, we, no, they don't exist. You guys just continue to do what you're going to do. And it wasn't that, from, from everything that I researched and read, it wasn't that the mine workers were asking for unreasonable wage. They were just asking for a fair wage. Again, they were tired of every month basically being in debt to the company and to the company stores. But this part of the part of the dream of coming to America is being able to squirrel away a little money, and eventually your children are going to have to work in the mines, and you can buy a house. You know, they 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 had they had seen the the picture of the Denver of the streets and the gas lights, and you know who in, in nineteen in the nineteen fourteen up through nineteen this area, wow, you know you can buy a car. You know, Model Ts were out and about, and you can buy a little chunk of land. And, 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 and start living a life that you, you never thought you could ever live. So it wasn't they weren't asking for uh, unreasonable pay, but they were just asking for fair pay. And that was all the point. And then what sets these motions into, in, into going on is uh, on August 16th, 1913, there was uh, an organizer down there named Gerald Liapit, I guess. Um, he was an organizer and he was he had run in with uh, Baldwin Fells detectives down there and they shot him. There was an investigation, there was a, a trial, and the jury said, you know, it, it was reasonable. He was, uh, Mr. Lightfoot was uh, a threat, and the Baldwin Fells detectives uh, thought that he was going to be uh, a threat to them. So the shooting essentially was justified, and that would help lead. Uh, the miners to start to un or not unionize, but solidify and become um, start to use violence against their aggressors. And then here's the beginning. So on September 13th, they walked off the job. Twenty thousand miners and their families were evicted from company housing that same day. So get out, and these guys had no place to go. And Mark can tell you more about that. So. Put yourself in the shoes of these miners, just barely scraping by everything that they have, everything that they own belongs to the mine companies. And one day they basically, as one, 20,000 20, of them say, we're done. Now I know myself, I'm a registered nurse. I work in an emergency room over in Lamar, Colorado. And I thank God every day I have a job. 
I have a well-paying job, I have a house, I'm sending my kids to college, I have a car, I have food in my fridge. But one of the few things that horrifies me more than anything else is losing my job. Losing my ability to provide for my family, losing my home, losing my ability to provide for my kids' futures. But the conditions have gotten so bad that these men and their families just walked away. Walked away from housing, walked away from medical care, walked away from the company stores, and just gave everything up. Took what little they had, loaded it in the wagons, and then established camps. The biggest one being Ludlow. There are camps, small small camps, large camps, all up and down, as I want to call it, the I-25 corridor. Um, the United Mine Workers of America purchased sections of land and purchased all those tents that the miners had lived in. And they weren't just allowed, the miners weren't just allowed just to loaf around. They said they had organized, they, as some of them, the miners went out and worked for local farmers, ranchers. Some of them would, would go away for periods of time and work on ranches for money and then bring that money back to the camps to, to help provide for their families. Um, people were very sympathetic to this. Um, they're uh, down, in, down in Trinidad and in Walsenburg. People and the local ranchers and, and even doctors were sympathetic to these people. They knew they were hardworking folks, but they needed help. So the camps got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and then it says here by September 24th, about 80% of the miners had stopped work. And so then the mine, work, the mine owners themselves started bringing in strike breakers. And strike breakers, again, are men who just need work, but will work for the lowest wage and will work for anything. And it's just, and history has proven itself that once you have men with a cause and then you have men who just want to earn a check, there's going to be friction. And that friction kept building and building and building. So as a result, essentially, CF9 shuts down, no coal, no steel. So Governor Evans at this point attempts to step in, tries to get the two sides to, to talk. There's some, some name calling, some lead slinging going back and forth, so it doesn't happen. So CFNI is officially shut down. That's gonna affect the Rockefellers. I, even though they're millionaires, a trickle down effect is gonna start taking its toll, not just on them, but on the local economies, et cetera. Because well, this is the age of steel, skyscrapers. And, 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 and uh, the subway tracks and bridges all depended on this high quality steel being built. So something like, you know, something like, that, like the steel mill here in Pueblo being shut down had, uh, had ripple effects across the entire country, not just in the Rockefeller's pocketbook, but in industry and everything else. One steel mill shutting down impacts the entire country. So Mother Jones, she comes in at this, about this point she arrives in the town. She's obviously very upset and she's gonna, you know, get the nation to, she's gonna draw attention to what's going on in coal fields and how to write it. So <laughs> she rides on the 23rd and I like this quote here. It's really good. It says, rise up and strike. If you are too cowardly, there are enough women in this country to come here and beat the hell out of you. So, she was a firecracker. She, she was, I, yeah, a cold, a cold jail cell was not going to break Mother Jones. Um, when these women, the women march, there was a, a as the, and there's actual pictures of, of the march itself. Um, the state guard actually was called in to try to keep order during this march, women's march. Um, now you can see these women are, they're, they're dressed in their Sunday finest. They got their God bless Mother Jones sign, United States flag. You know, that you can tell they're, they're, they're dressed to impress and you got all the men staying back here out of the, <laughs> stay out of the women's way, let the women do, let the women do this work. As they're marching down, down the, down the road, um, there's a little incident between the women marchers and, and the National Guard where the general, uh, was down there watching and apparently there was uh, some, someone threw a rock and I think the general's horse reared. He goes flying off his horse, hits the dirt, jumps back up on his horse and tells his men to charge at the women. Mm -hmm. And several of them are hit with the back of sabers, are knocked over, injured, some very seriously. And all that does is antagonize them even, even more. And then Mother Jones gets thrown in jail. 
So you can see even with the women marching down the road, there was no mercy for these folks. So at this time now, it's, things are getting serious. So Sheriff, Sheriff Farr from Orfanoe County and uh, the Sheriff from Los Angeles County say, you know what, we do not have enough boots on the ground. They put a telegram out to law enforcement communities and just regular communities in New Mexico and Texas and say, hey, we need some help. So about this time, we get about seven deputies arriving from both of those states to help bolster the law enforcement. And at this period, in this period, the, the Colorado National Guard, they're just there. They're not interacting with the miners. They're just there as a, as a reactionary force, essentially. So as they're not stepping up, the, your sheriffs are, are calling for more deputies because the dookie's about to hit the fan. <laughs> so as we talked about earlier, it's the Red Bull Tent Colony. We talked about uh, having a population of about 200, and, uh, and it's your largest strike center. All these other little uh, mining colonies, as Mark can attest to, are you know, smaller, but this is the, the beehive. This is the, the brain, the, the nexus of the strike here. At 1,200 people. You can imagine just 1,200 people living in out in elements. I don't know how many of you have ever lived under a canvas tent before, but uh, it's not very warm. In the elements, in the snow, but they stayed there. They stayed there. They did. Very few of the, of the inhabitants of the Ludlow camp said that we can't handle this and left. They were that dedicated to the strike. And the camp kept growing and growing and growing until it had about 1,200 people living there. So about this point, Governor Ammons is going, well, maybe I need to do something. I got the Rockefellers barking at me constantly, do something, do something. And at this point, the state is essentially broke. They don't have a lot of tax payer dollars coming in. So Governor Ammons has to sit down with the state treasurer and with a couple different banks and sign off on some, I forget what they're called, a promissory notes essentially, <coughs> to raise about $600,000. To, and that helps mobilize the guard, get them down from where they're established at, basically Denver and north, and bring them down by train to Ludlow and get them to set up. And that's the state's response, essentially. Um, so, and at this point, too, now, as the mine uh, owners are bringing in scabs, essentially, that's one of their jobs is to, to help protect the scabs as they... Uh, arrive at the mines and to keep them away from the, the striking miners. The miners themselves had no issue with the with the guardsmen, but the the full sworn Colorado National Guardsmen. In fact, they were they knew that the guardsmen were there also to in a way protect them from you know, try their best to protect them from miners. Um, they, they enjoyed, you know, every so often there at the Ludlow camp, they would actually have baseball games between the National Guardsmen that were camped outside the Ludlow camp and, and the, the strikers themselves. Obviously, you know, not a true, you know, throat, you know, slip throat adversarial relationship if you want to play baseball with a uh, other team. So, but it, that, it went sour. It went sour pretty quick. And when the guard arrives, actually the uh, Ludlow camp band was there. And greeted them with uh, the battle cry, yeah, battle, battle, cry of, battle cry of the Republic, and actually organized a picnic for, them, yeah. for the for the for the full Colorado National Guards, not not the replacements that would attack Ludlow itself. So, like I was talking about earlier, the state of Colorado is broke. So, yeah. but they need to to move the National Guard down there because this is a powder keg and it's about to explode. So. They're there from April 19th, or, excuse me, October 1913, through April 1914. But I think, as I alluded to earlier, um, there was a provision in their contracts that stated that if they hadn't been paid in months, which happened, they were free to go back and earn a living for themselves and their families. So at this time, uh, the your regular National Guard, they, they exit the strike zone. And now uh, Lieutenant Linderfeld and Major Hamrock will go recruit two ad hoc companies for 
to fill in for the missing uh, National Guardsmen. And uh, so Linder, Lieutenant Linderfelt is here in the center with a smart gun space. This fellow right here. He's the one who's got all the connections with the law enforcement community, with the strike breakers, with Baldwin Phelps detective agencies. He says, hey guys, I need bodies. Come help me out. And so he does. He recruits guys to, to fill in and uh, take station there at the, the Lidlow colony. And then, as we were talking about earlier, this is the murder special. And I don't know the thickness of the plates on that thing, but as you can see, back in the old days, you could go to the coal factory and say, hey, sell me a machine gun. No paperwork, no background check. Of course. <laughs> so there's the machine gun, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but this is the one of the prime uh, means of terror that's sold amongst the, uh, the miners. I... I... I'm so into history. One of the money draining hobbies I have is antique automobiles. And if any of the rest of you in here deal with antique automobiles, my condolences. Um, <laughs> antique automobiles eat money. I have them, and it's not as old as this one. This is probably a 19, 1914 or earlier uh, car, but I own a model, a 1930 uh, Ford sedan. Um, that's no small feat to take that, strip it down to the frame, and well, a big steel tub to it. That's a lot of steel, I and mean, I guarantee you that car did not go very fast. <laughs> did not go very fast at all. But you can see how it's completely modified with the machine gun in the back. And this was a source where the Baldwin Feltz was just a source of pride. And this car would go up and down that road right in front of Ludlow Camp, stop, they'd spray some rounds, and then they'd take off again. I'm mean, top speed, probably 35 miles an hour, but that even more dangerous in itself. So we're starting to build up now to April 20th. And uh, so between September 1913 and April 1914, you have both sides that are just kicking at each other, essentially. Um, they do use dynamite against each other. They dynamite scabs and stuff out of their, uh, out of their living quarters. Um, there are assaults and murders that go on almost on a daily basis, really. And it's just back and forth, tit for tat, et cetera. And uh, again, the regular National Guard, they're standing by to prevent this kind of violence, but they really can't. So we have, you know, everything's really primed to explode now for April 20th. A few days before April 20th at the Forbes camp, which is just a little south of, of Ludlow itself, um, there was a, a smaller Ludlow attack. Um, the Forbes camp um, was attacked by uh, strike breakers and, and, and ad hoc guardsmen. Uh, two women and uh, two women and two children were killed at the Forbes camp just a few days before Ludlow itself. Um, and like Craig said, um, one of the uh, at Forbes camp, what caused the guard to attack the Forbes camp was that one of the uh, strike breakers or scabs was actually found dead in a ditch, and the mines complained about it. Um, there was an earlier slide that showed um, a body lying in a ditch at the Forbes camp. And so it was, it was just hit for tat. You know, they would snipe someone, throw dino. Miners had access to dynamite. What's a mine without dynamite, right? So, and dynamite would play a big part in Ludlow itself. Um, and it was just, it was, it was just, it was just, it was just murder on both sides. Both sides were guilty of the violence. And that's the one thing about Ludlow is that when you talk about Ludlow, Ludlow did not happen in just a vacuum itself. There were a series of incidents, um, some of it leading months, decades up to Ludlow itself. But this is where it, it, the heat is on. And the skirmishes started happening and the, and the body count started increasing. So <clears throat> with all that going on at the same time, down in New Mexico, they have a big mining disaster. 263 miners are killed. And again, it's over safety issues, essentially, had the safety regulations been put into place. May have been averted, but this is, again, another, you know, tipping point, essentially, that's going to help lead the striking miners to. What they're thinking that caused the disaster at Dawson down in New Mexico it was coal dust and gases. <laughs> 
Um, if any of you know anything about coal, coal mining, you know that, that the, the, the gases, the explosive gases that come out of the ground itself aren't the biggest hazard. One of the biggest hazards is the dust. When that dust ignites, it just flashes. And these mines hadn't been shored up and, and the miners were working as hard as they could, like 12 hour shifts, seven days a week, and the safety regulations were just ignored and ignored and ignored. When, and safe mines, they would go through and they would spray water. Water was constantly being sprayed in mines to keep the dust down. Or well, what they're thinking what happened with Dawson is that the dust had built up. The miners were complaining about the dust, that one of the miners' carbide headlamps ignited the dust. Mm -hmm. And it just exploded the whole mine just up and down. 263 miners buried, gone. They're still on the ground down there in New Mexico. And if you imagine that today, if we had a mine here in the United States in 2023, that a mine had 263 deaths in it, that'd be that'd be an international, that'd be a scandal beyond all belief. But this we'll find more people. And so Within a short period of time, the mine was just back, back, back in work again. So now we're going to flash forward to January of 1914. And as we were talking about earlier, there was that women's protest against the, the mine owners, essentially, and stuff. And this is an actual picture. This is this is the picture of the, the Colorado National Guard chasing women and children down. And apparently, one National Guardsman dismounted his horse and chased a boy through the streets. Caught up to him, grabbed him, and punched him square in the face. Just, you know, just brutality. Just, yeah, this is that. this, in fact, in this picture that you can see, this is it's blurred behind this head right here. But that's that's the general right there about to hit the dirt from having rocks going out. You can see the soldiers out there with sabers and pushing all the women back. Yeah, it, was, it was pretty rough right there in the streets of Trinidad. And then we have uh, supposedly in the camp, in the National Guard camp near Walsenburg, supposedly they found an explosive device and that was proof enough, I guess, for the, the, the government and for the mine employees to say, this is real now. These guys are trying to blow us up. So now here's this unease now with the National Guard, with the miners. Every, the tension is, is mounting and it's going to be pretty ugly. And then here in March of 1914, there was a strike breaker that was murdered and left in the, in the tracks, essentially. And uh, as we were talking about Forbes earlier, this is that incident. And as a result, uh, they came in and burned the, that camp down, burned it to the ground, and that left people out in the elements exposed and uh, led to, to uh, Newborns who were just days old, they froze to death essentially because of this action. And now the stage is set essentially. So we've got Mother Jones, she's she comes back to Trinidad, and uh, she's in prison. She's again in prison and taken in, but she's taken. This is the Warfield County Jail, and this is the only period picture I could find. Of the Borfino County Jail. Here we have the courthouse you that might be familiar with right off Main Street. But so she comes back and she's held for 26 days. Um, and at that time they're like, wow, this old woman is in this jail cell. It's freezing, it's cold, she has terrible food. But really, that was all an exaggeration. And moving on now. So this is Easter Orthodox Sunday, April 4, April 19, 1914. So in, in Orthodox Church and 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 Catholic and, and Catholic Big C Little C Easter are on separate days. Mm -hmm. um, you know the, the 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 Catholic Easter is usually earlier, and in the Greek Orthodox it's usually a little later in the month. Mm -hmm. And on this. Um, it was April 19th. And usually an, an Orthodox Easter is a time for, they have uh, food and, and services and games. It's, it is a, it's a time for celebration. It's a time for big celebration. Um, they had, they had, and, and if you ever, and again, you can picture yourself going to Ludlow 
right across the street from the Ludlow Monument in that corner before you turn to go to the town of Ludlow itself, there's an empty field. And that was a baseball diamond. They had a baseball field out there and they, they would go out and play baseball games. And this right here is, is the one of the Ludlow, Ludlow women's baseball team. Um, we, we exchange insults with uh, members of the, of the Colorado National Guardsmen. And one of the guardsmen was heard this said, go ahead, have your good time today, and tomorrow we will get your roast. So it makes me kind of wonder if, if they had premeditation, are they planning to burn the colony? I mean, it just sticks out in my mind like it's, it just seems like it's a prelude. I mean, it is a prelude, but it just, it seems like there's premeditation on their part at this point. So moving on, this is a Monday now, April 20th. Louis T. This was uh, summoned by Major Hamrock to meet him at the uh, train station. Tensions are just all over the place, and they needed to sit down and discuss what was going on and how they could, uh, you know, keep it from boiling over. Julie. The accusation was that there was a woman who was looking for her husband who they say was being held against his will in, in, in the camp itself. And so Louis the Greek and Major Hanrock met at the Ludlow train station. Uh, and, and, uh, and Louis went willingly because he knew he could talk to Major Hanrock. And that's who he did, he did all his negotiations with. And they thought there was nothing else. He was going to go talk to him, tell him that this man wasn't in the camp, and they were going to go back. Because this is, this is the morning, the morning after, after Easter. And so people are just getting out of bed. They're just getting ready to start their day. Um, if, if you go down there, uh, April 20th of any year, at 9 o'clock in the morning, um, the wind is blowing. It's cold, pretty desolate. But they're just getting ready to start their day, and then all hell breaks loose. So this is right around 9 a.m., give or take. So... As I alluded to earlier, Major Hamlock calls down to the National Guard Army in Trinidad and says, hey, put that baby in a buggy and bring it up here. And that alludes, that's the Colt 1895 machine gun that you see set up there on uh, Water Tank Hill. So they, they dug an emplacement for it. It's an actual fortified position, essentially. Um, I'm not sure the distance between that and the camp, but I mean, it's, it's at extreme range, really, even for that particular 30 on six um, caliber machine gun. But uh, uh, as uh, uh, Tethys saw this as he was returning to the camp, he saw the arrival of the uh, surmounted members of the National Guard and they brought the wagon with the machine gun. So the miners in the camp see this and go, oh no. So, and then how the miners responded is that they had guns in the camp. And that was always a point of contention with, with, the, with law enforcement, National Guard, is that they would come through the camp every once in a while and kind of try to roust it out and, and find guns. But these are miners, and they've dug pits, and these guns are hidden. And they're not just one or two guns. The miners were very well armed. By the time they saw this machine gun being placed, um, the Greek miners, most of which had military experience, had already rushed out and had creed dug positions of their own facing the militia camp. And they don't know who fired the first shot, but there was a signal that happened that just everything broke loose. So real quick, we're going to talk about the 1895 Colt machine gun. <clears throat> it was designed by John M. Browning. I'm sure if you're a firearms aficionado as myself, you've heard the name. Um, it was first brought into service during the Spanish American War of the Navy and Marine Corps. At that period, it was in the 3040 Crag caliber. These ones are in 30 out 6 caliber. Um, it has a mechanical flaw. If you do a medium range burst, that barrel starts to heat up, and if you have ammunition in the chamber, it will explode. So it's not a great machine gun, and it's even kind of weak with uh, against its European contemporaries. It's about 200. Rounds a minute slower, but that's what they have at the time. So, and this is this could have been an equalizer if you have armed miners, hundreds of armed miners. This machine gun could have helped level the playing field had the events turned out differently. So, as Mark was saying earlier, um, 
they don't know really what happened who fired the first shot, but Lieutenant Benedict, who was with the National Guard, was in Berwyn Canyon, and he claimed that about that time, about 9.45, 10 o'clock, his unit came under fire from striking liners, so he lit off his signal for the National Guard to attack, which was three explosions, I assume, of, of dynamite. And when that happened, that's when all hell broke loose. So and after the, the three of the explosions happened, this is when Louis Tigas ran back to the camp because he knew that it, it, it was it was about to happen. And so, but the shooting had already started and it, it was too late to stop. There was, there was no way that, that any of this could stop it, but it was gonna happen. So as we alluded to earlier, you know, the miners know how to dig and that's what they did. They dug mining pits and this is a picture of the death pit where later on, after the tents were set afire, two women and 11 children are smothered to death in that pit. And this leads the press to label this battle as the Ludlow Massacre. If, uh, if, you, if you get a chance to go to Ludlow, and those who have uh, been to Ludlow, this, this pit is still there. You can actually walk down inside this pit. Um, I went down inside it last year at the anniversary on the date of the battle, uh, there was no one out there, so I had the site all for myself. Um, there's several accounts of, of books that I've used as a resource, and I sat in that pit and read the story of, of, of what happened in there. Um, two women, 11 children, and that pit is very small. It's very small, crammed in there. Um, you can see the remnants of the tent above it, charred, that's a mattress spring that's right above it. Um, after Ludlow, um, the United Mine Workers actually went in and reinforced the pit, and it is, it is basically, a, it is part of the monument to, to those who died. Um, it is an eerie experience. Now, I'm, I'm not a big believer in ghosts, but you definitely feel something down inside that pit, knowing that you're touching walls that, that women and children died in. I'm an emergency room nurse and I have seen people die of asphyxiation and burns. And I can think of short of, of very few ways, painful ways of dying than being in this pit. Oxygen, as the tent burned, oxygen is sucked out of that pit and you basically suffocate, you drown. The heat causes your airway to swell shut and you drown on your own secretions. They say that when they finally opened up this pit, they noticed on the walls and that fingernails had clawed at the walls to try to get out. And then if you can see, it's really kind of hard to tell. Right along there, you can see where the women and the kids had tried to crawl out of that pit. It took me, I, when I saw that picture and I blew it up and I saw them like, the rest of those walls are nice and smooth, but why is, and that's dying people clawing their way out of the pit. They laid in there. The youngest one was just a few months old, um, anywhere from six to eight year olds, 11 year olds, and, 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 uh, and the adult women. The, most of the children who died, their mothers survived the pit fire. The next day they pull her and another survivor out of the pit and they take her to Trinidad for medical care while her children are still left in the pit. They finally take the bodies out and they're buried down in Trinidad. The Costa family and several of the, of the children are buried down in there. It's one of the few places in Colorado that if you want to shed tears, that's a place. It is one of the eeriest, eeriest places I've, I've, I've ever seen in my life. A few years back, they actually to conserve the state of Colorado actually excavated around the pit. And in the back of the pit, there was a cross in the concrete that had been buried by the dirt. And they reburied the cross. They didn't want that. that, that that's for the dead people. But if you do get a chance to go down there and see that pit, please by all means and, and take some tissues with you. <laughs> so as we were talking about, this is a running gun battle. It's all day. There's several casualties on each side. One National Guardsman was struck in the neck and died, bled out. Uh, a couple of miners. There was a, a boy who was shot. He was running. He was running. His father was telling him to run. Because if you can imagine, at, at nine o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden this gunfire starts coming towards the camp. 
And these people are just getting out of bed. And if you read the period accounts, the women just grab their kids and run across, run across the open prairie. There's an arroyo behind the camp a few hundred yards back. The men are staying up front and they're fighting and, and, and shooting at the National Guardsmen. And the women and children are running through the through the tent, the tent colony to try to get to this arroyo to safety. And one of the women talks about grabbing her children. She's still in her night clothes, no shoes on her feet, and running across that open prairie. And if you're from southern Colorado, and if you've ever run across an open prairie, you know it's full of cactus and birds and goat heads. And the woman talks about running and, and stumbling over these cactus, and she did not stop. And when she finally got to the rail, her feet were just bloody raw, full full of cactus vines. And the little boy who actually died. His father was, he was telling his son to run, run, run. And the little boy was running across the camp to the bolt to the back of the head. His father watched him drop. And so he snatched his son up and kept running. They even ran down the railroad tracks. There was a water tank, an old water tank that had been abandoned that was probably filled full about four feet of just rotten water, standing water full of just debris. And the women and children were jumping down inside this water tank just to try to avoid the bullets. And so these women and kids kept running and running and running. Um, and this, like I said, this wasn't just a 30-minute fight. This was from 9 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock at night, running from 10 to 10 in the pit. Some of the families never left their pits. They figured we'll stay there and stay. And then, of course, in this, this poor pit that turned out to not be true. So we have the firefight, essentially, that Colt machine gun in action all day, essentially. But... The colony actually gets a, a respite from the incessant fire here. About 7 p.m., a Colorado Southern train arrived at the Ludlow Station, and they had to pull into a sidetrack opposite the tech colony to let a northbound passenger train. So there's still traffic on these rail lines as this battle's going on. There's, like we said, there's people that have been killed and they're laying next to the track, and it must have been quite a spectacle. Um, so this train pulls into the station and it pulls in just perfect and it shields the, the colony for a while from that uh, fire from both the, the rifles and the machine gun. At, uh, and the, 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 in fact, when the train was there, the, 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 the guardsmen went down to the train and at gunpoint told the engineer, get this train out of here. And the, the, the conductor and the engineer saw what was going on. and. Uh, we, their names are lost to history, but they deserve they deserve sainthood because they suddenly played dumb for a while. It's going to take a while to get this train moving. It's going to take, we can't just take off right away. And so that train stayed stuck there. You can still see, if you get on Google Earth and you look at Ludlow, you can still see the rail bed where the train had stopped. And it was perfectly in place right in front of that machine gun. They couldn't fire that machine gun anymore. And so it gave those families a chance to get to that arroyo and get away from the gunfire. And by that time, by the time the, the engineer finally said, oh, we can move the train now, the camp was basically abandoned. So about dusk on April 20th, the fighting is winding down, the firing is winding down, but now the National Guard is like, well, they're gonna, somebody had quoted, and I wish I could remember who it was, but somebody quoted this, when the National Guard went from being an army to a mob, and essentially that's what they did. They started burning tents, they started looting the possessions of the miners and their families, and this goes, you know, this it's a holocaust essentially. It's scorched earth. Yeah, if, if you see the pictures of the camp afterward, it wasn't just a few tents burned, it was all the tents burned. There's one picture of, of they, they said after the tents. There was one tent left standing out of all the rest of the tents of those 1,200 people. And possessions were being carted off. Because these, for the most part, weren't regular soldiers. Regular soldiers are disciplined. And then this is where it, it, these were these replacement soldiers that were going through. Um, and witnesses did see corn, corn brooms being doused with kerosene and lit a fire like torches. And they would just go up to the tent, light the tent on fire, light the tent on fire after they... And like I said, one of the tents had had eleven kids and, and four women. <laughs> so, as we alluded to earlier, uh, as the battle's winding down, the National Guard is scouting through the the burned tent colony. They happen upon Lucius and two of his his men, and 
at this point, there's an argument that breaks out, and Lieutenant Linderfeld says something, you, you had the power to stop this, why didn't you? And him being the, the I don't know what exactly transpired, conversation-wise between them, but Linderfeld lost his uh, temper and took his Springfield light, rifle, like we said earlier, and busted it across Linderfeld, or, uh, Mr. Tickets' head, and then later on, him and the two associates were shot in the back and left to die next to the railroad tracks. And then, as we talked about, so some of the estimates that about 18 miners and one guardsman were killed, and then uh, there was a Presbyterian minister that arrived from Trinidad, him and some relief people had started coming through the colony with the permission of the National Guard, and that's when they came across the bodies of the two women and the children. They say that the, the, the mother who had survived, her, her children did not. After Ludlow, she went on, on, on a, a tour with uh, United Mine Workers to tell the story of what happened to her children. And understandably so, she said that at the day of her children died, the lights went out in her world. And she survived, she alone survived all of her children. So now the press is getting word of what's going on the, around the wire, as they say. So uh, some of the fallout from this is we have the Battle of Walsenburg, which is a, a four-day battle, and then the Battle of uh, Forbes Coal Camp on April 30th. It's referred to as the 10 Days War, and that really is a whole other presentation. It's its own, it has its own dynamic, its own flow, its own story. Um, but uh, moving on, so at this point, President Wilson is he no longer he's no longer uh, aloof to what's been going on. Um, his labor secretaries, you know, yelling at him, "Hey, this has got to stop." So uh, he will um, invoke the Insurrection Act of 1807. That allows him to send two regiments of cavalry from Fort Riley, Kansas, into the Colorado uh, coal fields to help restore order because you can't now trust your, your county law enforcement as they were involved on the side of the mine owners. So he had to go federal and keep. Uh, but I like this picture though. Here's a, a regular with uh, the U.S. Army cavalryman, and he's uh, you know shaking hands with somebody who's grateful he's there. Somebody who's actually gonna, you know, do something and you know help restore law and order. And then we talk about the federal intervention. Uh, so Wilson will order Secretary of Labor William Wilson to work with the miners' unions to conclude the strike. Some of the proposals that come out of it is a three-year truce on acts of intimidation on both sides, and that Colorado's mining laws would follow along with contractual alterations as uh, was seen fit. Um, and then on September 16th, they have a, a special convention in Trinidad, and it's ratified by a 10 to 1 margin. The strike itself continued through the end of the year um, with United Mine Workers. Um, their end of it ended um, in December when United Mine, United Mine Workers ran out of money. The strike went bankrupt. They could no longer feed the tent colonies, and could no longer feed the strikers. And so at their end, um, the strike was was financially over. But it wasn't over. It, it wasn't over by a long shot. Um, but the federal intervention, I, I find it uh, at this time, this time in history, if you think about it, you know, this is 1914 going on into 1915. In 1916, we're fighting down in Mexico. In 1917, 1918, we're fighting in World War One. This is a time and period in our history that every month was something bigger and bigger. But Ludlow itself, like Craig was saying earlier, that, that it became, it was big news for a flash. Because at the same time, the United States Marines and Navy had landed in, in Veracruz, New Mexico. We had already been in Mexico in the 1840s. Here we are back again. It's kind of a prelude to our little, our little uh, punitive expedition down in Mexico. But Ludlow, excuse me, Ludlow got to the point where it was so despised, so egregious, so contrary, even just to public decency, 
that when the National Guard was called in Denver to go down there immediately, the guardsmen that were back up in Denver refused to go. They didn't want to go back down. They said, we heard what happened down there. We refused. Basically, they went against orders and said, we're not going down. We're not going down. We're not playing any part of it. Um, it did hit the newspapers in, in, in Washington, and especially when, when they found out about the children that had died there, it was just it just it just exploded. But unfortunately, history buried it pretty quick. So we're talking about some of the fatalities in the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office recorded over 200 deaths from 1910 to 1914 that were related to the strike. But modern historians now don't necessarily agree on the counts, but the they tend to think that there was about 30 guardsmen that were killed uh, along with strike raiders and mine guards. And they don't, they think only maybe a handful of miners actually died from gunshot wounds that were directly involved in the Battle of Lemo. And of course, these numbers don't include uh, non combatants and bystanders. And you'll see a lot more of the bystanders and non combatants being killed in the Battle of Wilson. There, there was, was one, one uh, bystander at Ludlow. Um, again, as you're driving towards the Ludlow site, there's a farm probably, I'd say probably half a quarter mile to the east. Um, a young boy, a young young man was just kind of standing out in the roadway seeing what was going on and a ricochet hit him in the chest. Not even near Ludlow, the camp itself, there's just an unlucky ricochet. That's how many bullets were flying through the air that day, where a ricochet from one of the rifles and machine guns went through the air and struck him. Over, but he was not considered until later in history was not considered one of the casualties of Ludlow. So now we're going to deal with some of the legal fallout of the Battle of Ludlow. It's estimated that over 400 minor, miners were tried for crimes, including murder, obviously, that were committed. Only four miners were convicted, and those convictions were shortly overturned. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think the uh, the law enforcement end of it. Uh, you have to deal with such a situation. I mean, this is kind of a precedent, really, in American history. Um, so they weren't ill prepared for it and uh, kind of swept it under the rug. And then we talk about the National Guard and what happened with them. So both Major Hamrock and Lieutenant Winterfeld faced separate court martials for their actions. Uh, charges included manslaughter, arson, and murder, to which Hamrock pled not guilty, and his charges were dismissed. Winterfeld admitted to striking Titus with his rifle, and the court said, okay, that's assault, but it's not criminal. So he probably got a, a letter of reprimand in his file, and that was it. So really no justice anywhere to be seen. And then we talk about maybe start fresh. So although the United Mine Workers failed to gain recognition, uh, some good did come out of it. Um, John D. Rockefeller Jr. instituted a, a series of sweeping reforms that have been considered the first in any industry, including safety, health, and recreation benefits. And then, like I talked about earlier, uh, the establishment of the eight-hour workday and uh, revising child labor laws. So, you know, to, to come to this presentation, which, which I, I've enjoyed, talking to you all about. I had to go to my boss, my manager, and put in a time off request. <laughs> Ask for some time off to come to Pueblo from Lamar and talk about Ludlow. A couple weeks ago, I, one of my kids was sick, and uh, all I had to do was make a phone call and say, Leslie, my daughter's sick. I'm not coming into work tonight. Anytime I go to work, just walking into the hospital, I'm on the clock and I'm getting paid. I get sick leave, vacation leave, catastrophic leave, Short-term injury pain. It's it's I got everything, every everything I everything and I'm a nurse, so I, I earn my money. But um, I want time off. This summer I'm I'm just because my girls are going off to college. I want a week off to a celebrate their departure <laughs> off to college. I'm gonna go down to Mexico and probably get drunk on green chili. Sorry, Pueblo. I know you're green chili, but I can do that. I can do that. It's a piece of paper and I can do that. Thanks to folks like this. They pay and, that, and that's the respect that I give people. And you know, and, and when you when you do that, it's so easy to ask for time off. You can get benefits and you can you can just take you, you want a mental health day. You can take a day off from work. 
it's paid for with blood. Not just the miners at Ludlow, but the miners at Blair Mountain and, and so many other striking and so many other strikes and so many a bloody, horrible instances like this to where we today, you know, almost 110 years later, have it good because of these people that we can take time off. I'm not a union man. I, 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 I'm a nurse. I do my job. And there are nursing unions. And then unions do serve their purpose. And some people say unions are good, some are bad. And I'm not going to fight that fight. But these people pay that price so we can have. So I could be here tonight. That's how I look at this. So when I go to, when I went to Trinidad, and I, I'm standing over Louis the Greek's grave, He's buried right there in Trinidad. You can, visit. you can go to the Catholic cemetery in, in, in Trinidad and see the Costa family. They're buried in unmarked graves, but there's a memorial there. And you know, I just, I just as a, as a historian and, and as a worker, I have to say thank you, thank you for what you paid, so I can have time to live a good life. And then uh, we're gonna wrap it up here with this little poem by Frank Hayes. Here today we dedicate. Here today we consecrate a monument to their state here on Ludlow Field. Lo, the goal of justice nears, and we vision through the, our tears, freedom's martyred volunteers here on Ludlow Field. And that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, <laughs> Yes, do you have any questions? Yes. What what out the CF and I license plates? The state of Colorado has license plates and a petition? That I don't know. That I don't know. Actually, you know the 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 the, 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 um, the, the you could probably I would I would probably say you probably call the county board have some hands for because there's always a bill anytime you do a license plate it has to be a bill it has to be a petition for it. You know if you, if you go down um, I've 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 gone down when after I went to Ludlow on, on the anniversary of the battle I went to the, the mine workers office and it's a two two person operation um, down there now because the mines are shut down. And um, they were just amazed um, the fact that you know every June they have a, a memorial at the Ludlow site, and it's, it's more of a modern union, and they and they talk about the state of union and labor relations. Um, but the the lady that was down there that day was just kind of uh, amazed that you know that that people are still this very day interested in the history of Ludlow, um, the ramifications like Craig and Craig and I. Um, we enjoy the, the, the history of the moment itself, the, the history of the people itself. Um, knowing that you know that that part, if they're if they're putting out a you know, license plate that's going to commemorate any of this, no, it's for CF and I. That I don't know. And, you know, and the CF and I just just play play a, a part in this. Um, my opinion. This is just just my. If you ever look at big industry. If you look at, at you know Colorado Fuel and Iron and the Rockefellers, and, and I am I'm convinced just from the, from what I've read, and I encourage everyone to do their own research on this, but I am convinced that that Rockefeller Jr. was perhaps to a, a greater extent ignorant of what was going on out here in the Fields of Colorado. As information, you know, you don't want to anger the boss. Yeah. And 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 Rockefeller, after and after all this had happened. And, and everything had went down. You know, the man himself, when that monument was dedicated and this poem was read, went to Ludlow, like I said earlier, went to Ludlow. I think he wanted to make amends for what happened there. I mean, he told him, no, probably not, stay in your car, and there'll be another time for this. And he did enact what he felt were some, some reforms to the extent the reforms were, were, were followed through. But, um, you know, Colorado Fuel and Iron, that. You know, for the longest time, driving past that that that, that steel mill, I never ever knew the his how could the history of that steel mill and what the history of Ludlow and of Bergman and Forbes and Walsenburg, how much of that was centered right here in Ludlow, Colorado. You know, it's kind of a, I think people need to give Ludlow its props for what what role it's played in our in our state's history. So how? 
where the camp was, the one from the camp, how close was there an active um, not very far away. Just if, if, if you go up, if you, and you can still dr drive up to the, to the ruins of the mine right up there at Birdman. If, if you go with a picture in your mind, you go to the Ludlow, the, the monument, and you're driving to the ruins of the town of Ludlow itself. And as you drive, and you're going to go down a little arroyo, and you're going to go up a canyon, and Birdman Canyon is probably, I want to say, no more than maybe up. Mile or two away from Ludlow itself, and the mines are not very far. They're not very far from. I know the Forbes mine is the, where the Forbes camp and the Forbes mine were, and there were mines all over the place. So there was mines on the backside of the Spanish Peaks. There were coal mines all the way up the front range, even going up to Fort Collins. There were coal mines all over the front. Range. Well, another question is why did see if I have to shut down the mail? I think it was just for the availability of just the workers and the, and the, and the coal, the rail, the way the, the railroads connected to to get to the mines. I think it was just being able to get that coal to the mines quicker and just to keep the furnaces going. I thought maybe it would upset the because that was the whole. Problem was based on the whole economy was the steel mill. It's all the steel mill. So. Right here. Sorry. The, the CFNI? Yeah. The, I'm not sure. It, it hasn't been too long ago that they finally shut down their, their gas. They go, is it gas now? Yeah, there's still, it's been run by gas and it's been sold. Of course, the rumor when I was doing my research, the one of the rumors and get on the internet, and I was wanting to find who owns CFNI, who owns the mill now. I mean, it's the rumors it's run by a Russian oligarch and all this other stuff. <laughs> it's not a rumor, it is. Yeah. 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 It's true. It's true. He is a poor owner. He's not even. He just owns stock. He owns stock. But that shows you how 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 sensitive, even as I go, we now got Russian oligarchs on me. I tie that into everything. So. Yes. I see you have your items up there. Do you want to share? Yeah. Share? Yes. Um, yes. Um, my next. So part of human living history, besides the clothes and you know reading up on everything, is what people use in their day to day lives. So I brought a whole bunch uh, of stuff. But essentially, starting out, the Colorado National Guard, to include companies A and B, were issued the United States Magazine Rifle caliber 30 model of 1903, or known in collector circles as the 1903 Springfield rifle. It's a five round magazine, caliber 30-06. Um, when it was uh, presented to President Teddy Roosevelt, originally, uh, serial number one had a telescoping bayonet that came out from underneath and it come out and it locked. And we, we had some of those in the, the Mexican-American War, the Seminole Wars, in the 1880s, 1840s. Well, they're not very popular. It's not very good. Teddy Roosevelt said, nope, we're not gonna do that. So the rifle went back to the drawing board for about a year and a half. And he told him, I want a, uh, a sword bayonet. So this is the sword bayonet for the Mexican-American Springfield rifle. Now, I would think as the National Guard were going through the burned out camp that those guys would have had their bayonets out just in case they ran into it. Somebody tried to get the drop on. And uh, talking about some of the other items, um, we talked about Water Tank Hill. They dug that in, uh, that uh, emplacement up there. It was a fortified emplacement. So those guys had to have tools to do that. So a lot of our tools came out of our um, conflicts in the Spanish-American War and then following up in the Philippines. Uh, both places had a, a lot of foliage you had to cut through, big heavy stuff, so we didn't have dedicated tools to do that up until this point. So we had things like bolo knives that were used to cut out that rabbit brush, oak shrub brush, whatever. Um, the pit netting, we actually did that in placement. It was, it was pretty handy for issues like one per squad, and everybody even carrying an entrenching tool such as this to help do that pit, the pit matting. Or uh, you have things like the uh, little fashioned hand axe that was used. And then going into the field, I have my uh, 
This is, would have been my lookout as a National Guard. And this is a nine um, pocket uh, belt that carries a five round stripper clip for the 1903 Springfield. I have my haversack, I keep my rations in there. I got my bayonet scatter, keep my bayonet in. I have my uh, medical pack and I have a, a bandage. One of my wow. buddies gets shot or whatever. I, mean, I can treat him right there on the spot. And this is kind of, this is actually kind of cutting edge for 1914 for any military to actually carry individual medical aid. Got my canteen. And then to keep it all on me, I got this pair of suspenders because all this stuff gets heavy. So, um, and then these guys of companies A and B being with the Baldwin Phelps Detective Agency and being with the um, Warfield County, Los Angeles County, a lot of those guys carry their own personal firearms. So this is the 1890 Remington. It's called a police model because it's a five and a half inch barrel. It's in 44, 40 caliber. So it's a black powder rounds, even though you've had smokeless powdering out for nearly 20 years, black powder rounds are cheaper and still extremely uh, popular in the Western uh, states. So that's something I would have carried as my personal backup. And I think that's about all I have. And the, the, the miners and the, and the strikers themselves, these were civilians. They were soldiers. They carried everything they had was civilian clothes. Um, one of the only pieces of uniform that the miners had, I have around my neck and that's my red band. Um, yeah, and it's one of the many definitions, but we all heard the term redneck. Mm. Redneck just doesn't mean someone from Lamar. Redneck <laughs> means red bandana. This was a, what signified you as a striking miner. There was a picture of here. Oh. Lewis, you saw him wearing that big, big red bandana. This was what signified this was their uniform. All their clothing was uniform. Um, people wore wool, was durable. Um, of course, you got to remember this is still the winter time. Um, you know, they wore they wore cotton clothes, work boots, uh, bib overalls, um, weaponry. When they the, the weapons that they that they carried were all civilian weapons. And this uh, this is a 1894 Winchester rifle, um, 3030. Uh, this one was uh, 1912. This is a serial number on this one. Um, I think that dream that it may have been used at one moment. Um, but um, fourteen dollars from Sears. Yeah, yeah. I wish it were fourteen dollars now. But lever action, a lever action rifle. Um, a little bit of irony. The action on this rifle was was uh, designed by John Browning, who was the same gentleman who designed that machine gun that fired the rounds at Ludlow. Um, this was, they did. The state of Colorado actually did an archaeological dig a few years back. I've been lucky enough. To get a copy of their book, it's called Archaeology of Class War, a Colorado Coalfield Strike in 1913 1914. That's a pretty interesting cover with a, a doll set one that, that they found in one of the pits. And they found a, a good number of 30 30 rounds. Um, these go with that rifle. Um, the 30 30 rifle, um, very popular rifle, it's still used today. They said that more deer have been felled by this rifle. And that's what the quotes say uh, than any other any other hunting rifle. Um, they carried pistols, any pistol they can find. Um, some of the weapons they had, they had old uh, uh, trap or Springfield. Uh, I've seen pictures of them carrying 1866 Yellow Boy Winchesters, 1873 single shot rifles. Um, they carried Colt pistols. Um, there's one of the famous picture guy has a Colt pistol. He's got shoved in his coat pocket, which I thought would be very practical. <laughs> but these these are got these these they had no reason to carry weapons. They're miners, so these are just their personal protection weapons. Um, one of the accounts of the funeral of Louis Louis Tikas, as they talk about the women who uh, the survivors of the women at Ludlow started sewing all the miners the sacks out of out of flour bags out of flour sacks. And there's a newspaper, and these is where they carried their ammunition. And if they didn't have an ammo belt. They would just grab handfuls of, of grounds and throw it in sack and just throw it over and take off. And, and, and this is what they carried to, to go fight. So you see, very rudimentary. 
but they had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men um, that, that they armed very quickly and became a very, very efficient guerrilla army, chased the National Guard all over Southern Colorado to the point where they had to call in federal troops. Um, one of the mines at Forbes, um, the Battle of Forbes mine, they cornered the mine workers, the strikers in the mine. They had somehow gotten hold of a machine gun, um, cornered and unfortunately cornered children and women of the strikers in one of the mines, had this huge pitched gun battle. I think they burnt the stable that held all the mine mules and it killed some 70, 80 mules in, in, this, uh, in this stable. And as a result, four Japanese mine workers were killed up, killed at Forbes. Um, it, it was it was a it was bloody. It was very very bloody. Um, and then, like Craig was saying, there's a battle. If you ever get to go to Walsenburg, you're driving through Walsenburg to, to get over the mountain, and you see the hogback there as you're driving through Walsenburg. That hogback's a battlefield. That's all a battlefield. There, late after Ludlow, the miners and the National Guardsmen fought a battle along that hogback. All the way from the, you can still see the ruins of the, of the electric plant there in Walsenburg, mm -hmm. all the way to the lake on the other end. That whole log, whole hogback was just a running gun battle. There's, I don't, there's a historical marker mm -hmm. anywhere near there. I talk about that being a battlefield, but yeah, it is. People lost their life on that hogback, but it was miners with deer rifles and pistols fighting National Guardsmen with state of the art rifles for a period of months. Is there a book you'd recommend on the Colorado Coal Field War? Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I recommend Blood Passion. If you like concise, to the point um, information. So um, all these books you can get. Um, Amazon is a wonderful thing when you're a book fiend like me. Um, you can get uh, this book right here. It's called The Ludlow. This is a reprint of a book about the list called The Ludlow Massacre. And this was this – was, Printed shortly after after the, the, the massacre itself, and, you know, there's pictures of Louis Tikas and there's pictures of, of the minor strikers, National Guardsmen in the camp. Um, a lot, of, most of the pictures that Craig had in his presentation. Um, this was published by people sympathetic to the miners, so it's very biased towards the minor side of of the, of the conflict. This book, who in here has heard of George McGovern? George McGovern wrote his doctoral thesis on Ludlow, and this was the first um, compiled, historically researched book on the Battle of Ludlow that tried to look at both sides. And this was uh, George McGovern, um, in his PhD thesis, wrote about the Coalfield War, um, of course, and then after he became George McGovern, then it was, it was published into a book, and it's a very good book. But it's it's based a lot on the research that at the time. Um, the book on uh, blood passion, which like Craig is also um, one of my personal uh, favorites, is more it looks at both sides. Um, it's it's a little less political, and it takes both sides of the story. And he is very clear in here. He says, and he says in his, in his thesis, I am not here to pick sides. I am just here just to talk about the incident itself. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's not a very not a very thick one, but it, 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 it's a good, good, good book. And if you can get your hands on it, um, this is also a very good book, again, written by uh, the state of Colorado when they did uh, archaeology out, out of Ludlow. And, you know, if you're into archaeology, it's great, but it also has a really good, really good section on the history of, of the battle itself. Many of these artifacts were here in Pueblo just a few years ago. When they had that, it was an amazing exhibit where it was 3D interactive with the holograms. I, I thought History Colorado did a really good job, and the artifacts that they got out of the ground were, were in this book. Yes, but those, those, and and there's there's videos that have been put on on Ludlow, um, other books, but those those are the four that I would recommend. Thank you. If I'm not mistaken, I think we have some. Books here. I saw what fashion. Yeah. 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 What you know? I, I'm not trying to plug your books, but get a copy of it. No, just in saying, you know, it's it's a good. Yeah. It is a it, good. And the other thing I wanted to say is um, I wanted to make a comment about our lackluster President Wilson, <laughs> who at the time that he was ignoring this was ignoring women. 
because <laughs> suffrage was going on at that point. Mm -hmm. And he didn't give a crap for anybody. He was so worried about World War I that he didn't care about anything else. But this man was a joke. He really was. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So what happened the day after the battle? Where did the people, how did they get somewhere? So after the, the fight itself, um, the, 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 the women, there's a certain law well, called them survivors of, of, of the, the fight there at Ludlow, um, headed to the Arroyo and they stayed there overnight. Been in the cold, no fires, they, weren't, they didn't dare light fires to give away their position. The National Guard had, had, had torched the camp and then left. Um, the, the, the people died in, in, in the pit. Um, the children died, the bodies laying all over the place. Louis uh, Atikas and his, his two lieutenants were laying dead on the train tracks, and then the National Guard retreated. So the, the women and children who fled from the camp stayed out in that, the royals stayed out there and froze overnight. The next day, um, the word of, of the fight came up from Trinidad, and they started taking by train, wagon, and automobile, rude, very slow automobiles, down to Trinidad. Um, there's a, a doctor, the doctor, there's a doctor in, in Trinidad, just above, who treated a lot of the, the, the casualties. Um, Lewis's body was picked up. He and his lieutenants, again, laid out there for three days by protest. They were allowed to pick up their bodies. They took them to Trinidad and, and had a funeral for them. Um, there was so incendiary that um, one of the few ministers that was allowed, you got to remember these are. Greek Orthodox and, and Catholic and all, that the, the tensions were so high that when they had the funeral for, for Louis Ticus, they the miners themselves policed themselves and said, give us all your guns, you can back at your funeral. Because they figured that passion was going to be so high that the violence was going to come out of the funeral. Um, and they got, of course, got their guns back and formed their militia. Um, there are still fatalities after uh, people still died. Um, and after Ludlow, after the camp was burnt, um, shortly about a year later, they reestablished a smaller camp again at Ludlow. Mm -hmm. Just a smaller a strikers camp. It wasn't near the size of the, that of the original camp, but just because of the location of Ludlow, they, they established another camp. But the survivors, like I said, the, the, the mom who, who, who lost her children in, in the death pit, um, she was nursed back to health, and she went on tour with the mine workers to talk about talk about the massacre. Um, I'd like to think when I was driving up here, I was thinking about the, the people. This is 1914, and a lot of these are, are young men, young women, um, who still lived through the Roaring Twenties, lived through World War One. I'd like to think that some of these men at Ludlow probably enlisted in the army, fought over in Europe, came back, went through the Great Depression, probably through World War, World War II, the last survivor of Ludlow, and I wrote her name in here, um, Ermina Padilla Daly. She died in 2019, not too long ago, 105 years old. She was like she was, months old? Yeah, she was, yeah she, was, she was just a few months old at the time of, at, at the time of, of Ludlow. Of course, she didn't remember it, but just a few months old. She was one of those babies that was carried across the prairie and near darn froze to death in that arroyo. But she lived to be 105 years old and died just in 2019. There's no more survivors. She's the last one. I've given well, I need that. to stop in and help us close out tonight, but I don't, I could listen for hours because I'm just so moved. Um, we haven't gotten to any person yet because I came after being like I said, I'm Morale Jones, the director here of the museum. Of course, you met Rose Stevens of Seattle Stevens, um, who will hope open up tonight. And I'm just in so much gratitude, especially the last statements of realizing what people really went through after that battle, even the wars that they went on to. It brings a lot of gratitude in my heart, being a person grown, born and raised in a republic who hasn't had to go through any trauma like that, especially from a young child age or really too much in my life. So this really brings a level of reverence for our heritage and our history. So let's give a round of applause. For you. <laughs> Just to uh, share heritage, because I love to give gifts. My heritage is Turkish and Filipino. This is actually from Turkey. Uh, but I'm, like I said, born and raised here, uh, first generation um, American here. 
And so I have some gifts. I have one for Rose, who's had to head out for a bit. So Rose is amazing. This is a jasmine and tea candle. Um, and just honoring her and who she is. So I'd love to give a round of applause for her. Because she's and this is actually um, from China. Um, it's called have some snacks still if you'd like to stick around and talk to the speakers more. Um, we got snacks just put out while that talk is going on, so feel free to have that. And also the art is still for sale in here from our still workshop. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks for coming, guys. We have more events. Check out our Facebook. They're, they're good girls. <laughs> 